Hello, my name is Alex Steiner, and I'd like to talk to you about the, float, the uh, magmatic systems feeding flood basalt provinces and what we can learn about that magmatic system by examining the crystal cargo carried in those lavas, such as plagioclase minerals. Now, flood basalts typically manifest on the surface as the stacks of lavas that are run as one is erupted on top of another. And that builds up a temporal record that we can access through, the, through deliberate sampling. If basically, this uh, section here is from northern Kenya in the Turkana region. And we just walk up the side of the mountain here and grab a sample of each lava along the way up. That allows us to construct a stratigraphic column where we can compare one lava to the other and see how the magmatic system is changing through time. When we uh, closely examine the lavas uh, from this section here, we find that the lava textures uh, occur in basically two styles. We have a group of lavas that are dominantly aphiric. They don't have a lot of big crystals in them. We have a second grouping, which is uh, what we call porphyritic or crystal rich. And the main mineral we see is plagioclase. Now you'll notice on the right hand side here in the stratigraphic column that each lava texture tends to occur as these lava, as, as packages uh, of, of lavas in these groups. Now this has been this, this pattern of alternating aphiric and crystal rich lavas has been interpreted from other flood basalt provinces as being the result of pulsed magnetism, where a pulse begins with crystal rich stuff and then tails off into these aphiric lavas. For our section here in northern Kenya, we've identified five pulses of magnetism that have run through this system. And what we hope to do is to use the crystals that are held in these lavas to see if we can identify previous pulses in younger lavas which will give us some insight into how uh, crystals are recycled in the magmatic plumbing system. So if we, uh, we think that we may be able to identify multiple generations of plagioclase in a single lava. And so what we did is we analyzed about 300 different, uh, different crystals from throughout the stratigraphic section. And when we look at their chemistry, so in the whole rock or in the uh, major elements that we typically display as their uh, plagioclase's anorthite content, as well as trace elements, we see that each lava has basically one population of crystals. We don't see multiple populations or chemical populations of crystals in these lavas at all. They're basically a homogeneous uh, population of crystals in, in a single lava. Even though the composition of plagioclase changes with stratigraphic height, we don't see evidence of previous generations. So that original hypothesis didn't quite work out like we had hoped it would, but that's okay because we have a new observation of this lack of diversity. Um, two possibilities could explain the lack of compositional diversity in plagioclase that we see in, this, in the Northern Kenyan flood basalts. And that is one, that the plagioclase in an individual lava represents only one generation of crystallized material. Well, this is unlikely because we know that uh, flood basalt magmatic systems are open. They're constantly being recharged and new magmas mixing with old ones, which means the complete evacuation of the magmatic system, which is required for only one generation of crystals to be there, doesn't really work. Another possibility is that old crystals are recycled. Makes sense with the old mixing with the new, and that, they're, but that their original compositions are overwritten through a process known as diffusive reequilibration, which is a function of temperature and time. If you look at the diffusive reequilibration of titanium and plagioclase, you can see that in this red field here, so any for any temperature or amount of time there on the x-axis, that's in the red field, that old composition is retained. To lose it, we either have to be hot enough or those crystals in the magma, in a new magma long enough for that composition to be lost and reach uh, the blue field there. The yellow line is the composition, is the uh, um, the rate of diffusion for um, the uh, plagioclase composition of labradorite, which is what we predominantly see. Now, our calculations of the temperature of this system is about 1150 degrees centigrade, which means our crystals must have been in a fresh batch of magma for at least 10,000 years to result in the homogeneous compositions that we see. Those crystals that are even larger than the millimeter uh, scale that's uh, plotted here require even longer maybe up to 100,000 years. So in conclusion, the crystals that we see must have spent tens to hundreds of thousands of years in hot crystal storage. And the important thing is, is that prolonged storage time provides an opportunity to transfer an enormous amount of heat 
to the crust. This heating up the crust changes the way it responds to, say, stretching. We often see continental rifts forming after flood basalt provinces are erupted. So this may play an important role in how those happen. Thank you very much.